Good morning. This is Clive Titmus. I'm in my shop at Early Music Studio. And I'm just finishing off a loop mold here. You can see that it's uh, almost finished. I've got uh, all the sections in place. I have a little nose cone part where the ribs go. And that's the block right there. And uh, I'm just drawing on the, the lines for the ribs and then the, using a little tiny spoke shave here. I'm going to be putting the flats on these ribs so that the wood won't stand away from the mold and I can join the, uh, right on the edges here, I can, you can see that I can join exactly where the ribs meet together. This mold took uh, quite a while to make. These molds are, are quite slow to make but once you've got the mold made it, um, it's amazing how quickly you can make a, a bowl and of course you can make many many of them. I found I used to make them out of just with some of the sections missing on a board on the bottom and screwed from underneath but I really found that that wasn't very accurate and I didn't like the bowls that it made so I went to the extra uh, extent here and make the bowls now with this uh, material which is actually pine shelving and the beauty of that is that it's been sanded down to perfectly flat, it's easy to glue it together, it's easy to work with, it's quite soft, you just have to be careful to avoid there, you can see knots here you just try to avoid them when you're cutting the section out and uh, generally that's worked quite well for me. Some of the tools I've been using on this project, uh, one of the main things you use of course is a spoke shave. Here's the spoke shave. Here's a bigger one. This one I've, I've custom made some handles. There's a kit you can get that retrofits the spoke shave with these these big, uh, these are pear wood handles and that enables you to keep your hands clear of the uh, mold while you're actually scraping it like that or you're actually cutting it and uh, it's occasionally a little bit difficult because the grain direction it's end grain on here you have to go this way uh, on this part of the mold you have to go this way on that part of the mold and so in this part you can't go opposite the grain direction which goes this way but you have to go that way it's it's tricky but you know it's not not impossible to make the mark out the mold in the first place I use I use these uh, templates there are two templates that I use. One is this um, template that's uh, the whole uh, outside uh, profile of the lute. And then here is the back, the middle, this, this middle board right here is this section here. You can see in here I have a, a line drawn on that uh, piece that you can see that shows the comparison. So this, this lute is extremely flattened and if we out, come over here we can see I've got a drawing that I made of the lute. Uh, it's a design I've just kind of cooked it up. I, after making lutes for 35 years you can just sort of decide what you want to do. I would say maybe based on practice and um, that's, that's what I've been doing today. Another new piece of gear here is this really great machinist vise that I got recently. It's, it's a Chinese thing. And uh, once that's expensive, I've mounted it on a gigantic block of cherry here on my bench with four bolts. And the great thing about this is it rotates. So that is absolutely wonderful. While you're trying to work on these, um, these molds, uh, it's very difficult to work with just a normal vise because you're constantly changing the attitude that it has in order to get the best ergonomics for the, um, for the working of the wood. So this is... This, this really made things a lot easier. It was really worth it. I've had an old machinist vice for years and uh, caused constant problems. But this solved a lot of problems and it really wasn't very expensive. So that's a visit to the Early Music Studio workshop. You can see there's really a heck of a lot of tools here. <laughs> and um, love working in here, especially in the early morning when the sun's coming in. It's, it's November right now, so uh, we, we've got some very nice low angle sun up here in Canada. And you can see very clearly what you're working on, you don't need lights. So that's it for now. Goodbye. Hi, it's me. I'm back again. I just had uh, one little climb tetanus. I'm talking about my loop mold here. I had one little trick that I thought I might pass on to you. Um, one of the most difficult things about marking out loop molds is uh, that you've got to get your, your, your rib co contour, this line here, that actually describes the edge of the rib. Um, the way that that line is established is, is kind of difficult because what you do is you have to take this 
circumference of the mold here and divide that into equal sections or more or less equal sections and then I take this I use that to determine that and then I take this uh, here and I have to pin it at a point right at the nose cone of the mold here the, the end block of the nose where the neck and the body join and then I just pin that down there and I pin it down at the bottom here and um, then I join them together. Now in order to uh, come up with a decent measurement um, for this, you've got to be able to get these ribs approximately equal widths across the whole mold. And that is a very challenging thing because you have to measure that distance, divide it equally. Usually the two outer ribs are slightly larger, so there's a kind of, I would say that's a kind of analogy to temperament in music in, in a way. Um, the way you rearrange the semitones so that they they sound better. So this is a similar thing. The outer ribs have to be a bit larger because uh, they just seem to fit better on the mold for one thing and also you're going to take some material off there to get a slight uh, relief from the, for the soundboard so the, the soundboard slightly concave. Now um, one of the tricks that I got from this is from Nancy of Nancy, Nancy Zeman of Nancy's Notions. She recently died. She was, had this business in Wisconsin selling notions and I just happened to be uh, talking to my wife about uh, making things and she mentioned that the, one of the easiest ways to divide something equally is to mark arbitrarily uh, centimeters you, on a piece of elastic and then you just stretch the elastic anywhere and you want on the mold and you're going to get perfectly equal divisions. Well that made life really a lot easier so you're welcome. <laughs> so goodbye for now. Well, here we are in the Early Music Studio workshop again, and uh, this time, it's a few days later, I've worked on the mold for a while now, and I've uh, completed the marking out. You can see the, the pencil lines here, which I've had to renew several times because of the use of tools. And then uh, we've, we've completed this fluting procedure. Um, I used to just do flats on this part of the mold, but I have discovered after years of working um, fitting ribs together that if you actually remove more material you're more likely to get a better cleaner joint between the two ribs that are joined, being joined together. Um, there's a couple of points that I thought it might be interesting to have a look at here. One of the really interesting parts of this uh, lute is down here at the bottom of the mold where the ribs actually run off the mold instead of they join at a theoretical point down here somewhere below and um, I, that's kind of a, a consequence of the extreme flattening. You can see that this lute is very, very flattened. And another consequence of that flattening is the fact that the, the rib uh, contours, instead of being planar and flat and straight like that, are actually somewhat curved. So this is accomplished by using a shorter, a little bit shorter plane when planing the joints and careful fitting. It's a little more difficult, but um, I think the result is aesthetically very pleasing and um, the, uh, the shape of the lute of course is a kind of expression of um, a sort of geometrical rationalization of two shapes, um, one on the face of the instrument and one on the spine of the instrument and the way that those two shapes are resolved it seems to me that that's kind of a fundamental statement about what the lute really is. So over here at the, um, at the where the neck is joined, it, there's some interesting dynamics going on here. This part of the lute here is actually the, the spinal contour and the face contour get resolved into this, basically it's the same shape. But this still doesn't resolve itself into a semicircle, which is, w would be the case on an earlier Renaissance period instrument from around 1550s. Um, and once again, it's very important here to get this marking exactly correct so that the ribs, because it's really crucial, you can tolerate a little bit of inequality of the ribs on the, on the side of the lute. It isn't really noticed. But when the ribs become smaller and they meet at, the, um, at this terminus, point here, it, it becomes crucial that the ribs really be very equal or almost equal in size. 
So usually I just make this little template and, and just tack it on there and with little, these little marks on it and that enables me to have a very precise location. I used to do this just with a pencil on the block itself and I could never, could never get it right. So this is kind of an improvement I, I feel uh, in how this is done and of course this can be retained for um, later use on, on uh, when another lute is built on the same mold. And you just, it's just a simple matter of marking the ribs then and, uh, and the block. So I don't usually bother um, planing this flat, this, this, these here, to get when the rib is joined. I just simply, just before the rib is joined to the previous rib, start in the center and build outwards on both directions, I alternate. Um, and then uh, this, you just take a chisel and flatten it. And it it's very simple that way and you can actually make the uh, two levels of the two ribs joining together, you can really manipulate that very easily at the point where you're going to join it. Don't try to uh, sort of manipulate that at this point because it's just too early in the process. So that's um, just one little, more, one more thing to do here and that is to talk about how this, uh, these, so you, you saw the, the rib, the, the, the loop mold when it was a, a, a curved object and now it's got these flutes in it. So how was that accomplished? Well, I use uh, a bunch of these gouges to excavate uh, different widths and, and different curvatures. You can see that's a number four. It's about half an inch. I, use, I like the fishtail one. That seems to be extremely efficient in removing material. I like the smaller one. And down here at the bottom of the mold, you can, you can clearly see that it gets narrow quick, quite quickly, so you have to use a smaller gouge. Here you use a bigger one. And then that looks pretty rough, so then I, I use a couple of these little spoke shaves. One of them has a compound curvature, quite difficult to sharpen, but very useful to get the fluting. And then finally a rasp, a uh, pretty rough one. And then uh, a bigger one, uh, a, bit, a bit smoother. And then finally uh, a, a very smaller, a smaller one. And then at last some uh, small uh, just sanding tools, a little rubber block and a big piece of dowel here and some emery paper and that's pretty well it. Now the next thing to do will be to coat the uh, mold with some shellac and then uh, uh, some varnish and finally two coats of wax and then the mold will be ready to be used. That's it today from the Early Music Studio.